Well, guys, this day is special in so many ways, and I don't know what you have planned for the afternoon, whether it's with friends or with family or just around food, but it's also an opportunity to rest and to contemplate what this weekend and even the week leading up to this weekend has been all about. And sometimes it's amidst these significant holidays and seasons of rest where we begin to think about bigger questions. We get out of our normal routine and we contemplate the bigger picture for a moment. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever found yourself contemplating your current circumstances and wondering, how did I get here? Right? Maybe you just signed yourself up for an excruciating workout and you're enduring pain and suffering and you're thinking, wait a minute, why am I doing this? I think with your jobs, don't you do it with your job from time to time? We all have bad parts of our jobs. Sometimes we think, Lord, why am I doing this job? There's a hundred other jobs I could be doing right now. Why am I doing this one? And we think about it often with our housing situations. Your house is too big, need a smaller one. Too hard to clean. Your house is too small, need more space. We got a great big backyard. Oh, the backyard is so big, I have to mow it, mow it all the time. We're constantly contemplating the alternative to our current circumstance. And if we're honest, 99% of the time, it's a bad impulsive thought. We should not act on the thought, the grass is not always greener on the other side. But the reality is, is that because we are the way we are, we tend to do this kind of thing. And I think we even tend to do it with the most precious things in life, even our faith. Sometimes, again, because of the way we are, we are bent towards skepticism and discontentment and mistrust and even doubt. And we start to contemplate and wonder, what if this is not true? What if this book is really just made up and just a human collection of writings, but not really from God. What if Jesus didn't really raise from the dead? Now, I think even historically, we can affirm a few facts about Jesus. Number one, we can affirm that the historical man, Jesus of Nazareth, really lived. This is attested to by not one or not two, not three, but four independent gospel records, not to mention over 30 extra biblical records. The man Jesus is a historical person, that is fact. Second, we can affirm that the man Jesus, who was from Nazareth, really did die, and he died on a cross. Josephus, who wasn't even a believer, wrote about this, as did many, many others. Again, affirmed fact, number two. And number three, it is an affirmed fact that on the third day, the tomb was empty. His body was no longer there. Now, for the skeptics, you have to deal with that. And there are a few theories that have been postulated as to how that historical fact of an empty tomb may have happened. First, there's the swoon theory, that he didn't really die, but that he swooned his death. Second, there's the stolen body theory, that the disciples stole the body. And third, there's the hallucination theory, that maybe there was a mass hallucination of sorts. But regardless, friends, this morning, we have to grapple with these three facts. Jesus really lived. He really did die on a cross, and he really did leave us with an empty tomb. However, ever since the fall, we struggle with the simple exercise of faith. Like Thomas, the disciple of Jesus who doubted the validity of the resurrection, sometimes we contemplate alternatives. What if, what if, what if, and really the pinnacle of that deconstruction is what if Jesus wasn't really raised? Now, again, whether your next housing transition, your next job search, or for greater things like this, I think there can be benefit to sometimes playing out the scenario a few steps. So that's what I want to do this morning. This day, Resurrection Day, that's often called Easter, is about one thing. It is about the resurrection of Jesus. But because I know that we don't always live in the full faith of that reality, I want to lean in this morning to the alternative. I want to ask and answer, what if he hadn't been raised? What if he's not raised? And to do so, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you brought a Bible, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. If you didn't, there should be one under a seat nearby you, and you can turn to page 904. 904, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans then 1 Corinthians. 
And I'm going to go a little bit backwards this morning from our normal pattern here at Doxa Church. Our normal pattern is to take a book of the Bible and to work through it line by line, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. And typically I'll present to you the main idea of that passage on the front end. But this morning we're going to operate inductively. We're going to move into it backwards, if you will. And so I want to start with the inquisitive question, what if he hadn't been raised? And I want to show you six truths from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, that are really undone if he hadn't been raised. Okay? All right, so let's look. Number one, if Christ hasn't been raised, then number one, he's still dead. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Number one, then, is that if Christ hasn't been raised, then he's still dead, which you're welcome for that inquisitive pastoral insight. I know that's somewhat obvious, right? But let's think about this for a minute. In the first century, Paul's writing to the Corinthian audience, and in this era, they had a viewpoint that no one or no thing would resurrect. There was no resurrection. So Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writes the shocking consequence of that view that if that's true, then even Jesus didn't raise. Now, interestingly, just a few verses earlier, if you look up in your Bible, There's the validation of his resurrection given in that in verse 5, he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the 12, his disciples, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, and then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me, which is Paul. So this validation, verification of his resurrection was important to establish his claim that he rose. And yet, despite this evidence, despite his appearing to many and four meticulous records of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there were some who still doubted. Some who were rooted in their ways of religion and anti-Christ animosity, some who were bent towards skepticism. And for them, there's no resurrection if they claim that Jesus has not indeed raised from the dead, then they're left with one of those three theories. So I want to dive into those for a moment with you, returning then to those three alternative theories. If Christ has not been raised, then he's still dead, but we have to explain the empty tomb. Are you tracking? The first way that one might explain that is, again, the swoon theory. And this is the theory that Jesus feigned or faked his death, that he then miraculously recovered despite the brutal beating that he appeared to everyone, that he claimed to be resurrected, and then after 50 days, he disappeared, never to be seen again. Who knows, maybe in this theory he ran off to a mansion in Egypt or something. The problem with this swoon theory is many, though. First, in the description of the crucifixion, his death was certain. Jesus breathed his last breath He offered up his spirit and he died. It was confirmed by a stabbing of the spear in the side and blood and water gushed out, which is a sure sign of death. Second, though, is that his followers were so inspired that they were willing to then die. I just read this morning again that 11 of the 12 disciples died brutal deaths for the cause of Christ. You would think that if he had really not died, that one of the discerning men would have picked up on that and not been willing to go to that extent. A third issue with this view is where did he go? Is it really possible that Jesus completely disappeared off the face of the planet, never to be seen again in living form or after he died? Highly unlikely. And the final, maybe biggest problem with the swoon theory is what about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? The man who was a Christ hater, a persecutor of the way, who was converted to Christ. His name was changed to Paul, and we're reading his spirit-inspired words even here. How, what about Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, where he's headed to kill more Christians, and he's approached by the risen Lord and a blinding light, and he's blinded? The swoon theory does not do justice to explain the evidence before us. But what about then, second, the stolen body theory? Maybe this is the most fitting alternative if Christ was not raised. Well, this is the theory that the disciples stole the body and then propagated the lie that he had risen again. 
Again, issues are manifold here. First, how on earth would they have kept this a secret? You guys remember fifth grade, right? No secrets ever say secrets for long. Secrets always leak. Someone leaks about it. Furthermore, I think it's worth asking, why would they die for something that they knew was a lie? Makes no sense. Sure, men die for lies sometimes, but not lies that they typically know are lies. If they were the inventor of the lie, why would they be willing to die for it? And again, I think there's issue with the fact that they had hardcore bailed on Jesus at his crucifixion. But finally, there's issue because what about, again, the conversion of Saul into Paul? Well, finally, maybe it's the hallucination theory, where they all hallucinated seeing Jesus in resurrected form, and then they were convinced. Now, granted, it's true. Hallucinations can happen, especially under duress, under trauma. They haven't eaten. They haven't drank. Perhaps a hallucination could happen. But group hallucinations are suspect, to say the least, especially when there's a claimed coherence or congruency to the hallucination. Furthermore, typically when people come out of a hallucination, they're able to objectively look at the hallucination and see, oh, I was hallucinating. It still doesn't explain their willingness to die. And finally, it still does not explain the conversion of Saul to Paul on the road to Damascus. So again, guys, sticking with our theme here, realize, friends, that if Christ has not been raised, then that means he's still dead. And that means we are left with one of these three most common explanations for the historical fact of the empty tomb. If there's no resurrection, Christ has not been raised, he's still dead. But look back at 1 Corinthians 15. There's a second truth that's undone here. And it's that if Christ has not been raised, then the gospel amounts to nothing. In verse 14, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. This word vain is the idea of being devoid of any advantage or benefit. And this really then undoes everything that Paul and other biblical writers wrote. For example, just listen to a few. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Paul said that the gospel is of first importance. In Philemon, which we studied a few weeks ago, verse 13, Paul said, I'm imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. In 2 Timothy 1.8, he had suffered for the gospel. In 1 Timothy 1.11, he calls the gospel the glorious gospel of the blessed God. In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, the gospel had gone out to the Thessalonians and they had received it in power and in conviction and in the spirit. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the gospel is called the gospel of the glory of Christ. And yet, friends, sit in this for a moment with me. If Christ has not been raised, then all of this is pointless. Every word uttered in proclaiming the good news is a waste of breath. Every written document that's ever been recorded that pertains to the gospel is a waste of paper and ink. Every conversion story through the book of Acts and the millions of converts from then until now were a sham. If Christ has not been raised, the gospel is not somewhat useful. It's not a little bit useful. There is zero derived benefit from it. Why? Because it's all a lie. It amounts to nothing for them, for you, and for me. Without a resurrected Christ, the gospel is nothing. Number three, though, is that if Christ has not been raised, then third, God is also a liar. God is a liar. Look at verse 15. We are found even then to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, here's the the sequence of thought here. Track with me. As preachers and teachers of God's word, and even evangelists and missionaries and church planners, they they are misled. They're either misled or they're misleading. But let's just assume for a moment they're misled because they're preaching the book that was claimed to be the word of God based on the resurrection. If they're misled, who were they misled by? And that culpability goes back to the apostles, which again, you have a decision to make. Either they were misled or they were misleading. And if they were misled, who were the apostles misled by? And the answer is Christ. That Christ himself then, if the resurrection is not true, allowed his disciples, the apostles, to believe and propagate a lie. Therefore, Christ himself would be a liar. 
Not only is he culpable by implication, but by direct application as well. In Luke, if you want to turn there, you can, or you can listen a few books back. In Luke chapter 9, I think there's three realities that we have to deal with regarding things Jesus did and said in his time on earth. And the first is that Jesus predicted his own resurrection. So he predicted his own resurrection. In Luke chapter 9, verse 21, it says, He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He must be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And yet here it is, end of 22, on the third day he will be raised. This wasn't the only time, in fact, many, many occasions, Jesus predicted or foreshadowed his death. Another one is in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Taking the 12, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He'll be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. So if Christ has not been raised, Jesus is a liar because he predicted his resurrection. Not only that, but in Matthew chapter 26, a second fact we have to deal with is that Jesus booked a post-resurrection appointment. He put it in his calendar. (laughs) In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, referring to himself, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. In other words, track with me here. Jesus made an appointment after he would die with his men. Meet me up in Galilee. And then third and finally, Jesus told others to spread the word. He told them to talk about this. On the road to Emmaus, he's appeared to some of his disciples. And in Luke 24, verse 45, it says, He opened their minds to understand the scriptures And said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. That repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Well, here's the point. If Jesus wasn't really raised, then Jesus himself is a liar. And not just Jesus, but God the Father as well. Why? Because not once, but at least two times, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And of course, at that baptism scene, the spirit descended as well. Guys, I'm helping us to live in this for a moment, that the intellectually honest person cannot remain neutral or indifferent toward the resurrection. Sitting on the fence of general acceptance, or in my opinion, worse, tolerance of the Christian viewpoint is not tenable. It's not. That's why Jesus himself said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. So we very much so have a decision. Either Jesus was who he claimed to be and verified it with power in the resurrection, or Jesus wasn't really raised, which means he's a liar. Number four truth, returning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is that if Christ has not been raised, then number four, we are still culpable for our sin. Look back at the text, 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 17, that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and here it is, you are still in your sin. You see, here's what Paul's doing for us. He's he's really writing to convince us of something. And in this hypothetical chain of deconstruction, there's yet another implication to consider if you deny the resurrection of Jesus. And this would hit different, especially for the religious person. What would hit different about it? Well, for the religious person of the first century, namely the Jew, they had been offering sacrifices to no avail for 1,500 years. Now think about that, guys. You've been offering your bulls, your goats, your pigeons over and over and over, and yet one problem still remains. I've still got this sinful heart. I'm running out of bulls. I'm running out of goats. And so upon this uh, rejection of the resurrection, I can only imagine sitting there as a first century Jew thinking, you've got to be kidding me. We thought this was the Messiah, and now you guys are telling me he's not? Well, bring out the next bowl. Bring out the next goat. Here we go. 
Friends, think about this for a moment. The ramification of the nation of Israel rejecting their Messiah. To this day, I've been to Israel two times. There is a group, an organization called the Third Temple Treasury that every single year appeals to the Israeli government to abolish the Dome of the Rock, to abolish the mosque, to build and establish the third temple, and to resume temple worship and sacrifices. Understand then that one of the consequences for Judaism of rejecting their Messiah is that they're still in their sin. That 2,000 years have been impacted by the rejection of Messiah. 2,000 years there's been war over that land. 2,000 years they've poured out their lives to get a third temple built that was destroyed in AD 70, and they've still not dealt with their sin. But realize that the same is true for you and me. Even if you choose to reject that Jesus really was who he said he was and that he really rose from the dead, verse 17 says, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Guys, faith in and of itself doesn't save. You can believe something all you want, like a little kid who looks at his closet and just believes and believes and hopes that when he opens it, finally at last, it will give a passageway into another world. You can have faith all you want, but what matters is the object of our faith. What is our faith in? And if our faith is not in a risen Christ, then it is, according to Paul, futile or useless. If Christ has not been raised, I don't think I need to convince you that we still have a sin problem. Just look at the world. We live in a sin-cursed world, people. But not only out there is it still sinful, but especially, agreed? Especially in here. I've got radical agents that need to be dealt with, both forgiven and their power released. And if Christ has not raised, then I am back to square one with zero hope. No hope of forgiveness, no hope of change, and no hope of reconciliation when sin enters into relationships. So, on the flip side, it is very much so the cross of Christ and his resurrection power that does give us hope. And yet Paul is arguing here through the Spirit to us that if he's not been raised, then our sin still sits squarely on our shoulders. Our sin remains. Well, number five, continuing through this paragraph, if Christ has not been raised, then number five, all who have died are eternally gone. Look at verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He says they have perished. Now this phrase, fallen asleep, is Paul's way of nicely saying that a believer has passed on. They've gone on to be with the Lord. But if Christ has not been raised, then in fact they haven't. They haven't. Their soul has not carried on. The person has actually ceased to exist. Now, if this is true, then all kinds of credibility is lost, especially for our Old Testament writers. One consideration, I'll turn back to 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, we have this interesting story of King David. And here, King David has committed adultery. He's been unfaithful in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And in verse 15, it says, after having a son with his adulteress, that Nathan went into the house and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. So the little baby is sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted, and he went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. So David is prostrate, falling before the ground in prayer. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen. How then will we say to him, the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is this child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. And when he asked to set the food before him, he ate. Then his servant said to him, what is this thing you've done? You fasted and wept while the child was alive. But when the child died, you arose and had food. 
He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Friends, this passage is one of the greatest evidences that when babies die, they go directly to be with the Lord. David said, my infant has died. I shall go to be with him, but he cannot come to be with me. But I want us to sit in this reality for a moment. If it is in fact not true that Jesus rose from the dead, if he did not rise, then every young one who has ever passed on is not in heaven. They don't exist. Every middle-aged person who has tragically passed before their time has not lived on. Every elderly saint who we love and dearly miss is not in a better place. Understand that if Jesus Christ, who attested to be the Son of God and confirmed that with miracle signs and wonders, if he did not rise, then in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul argues there is zero hope for any resurrection. I have to tell you, pastorally, this significantly impacts the way I do ministry then. When I do ministry and I'm sitting with someone who's enduring physical suffering, whether they were born with it, they developed it, or they were in an accident, of course there's comfort that God provides in the moment. But there's also comfort in the hope of a future relief, in the hope of future expectation that though your outer body decays, your inner body is being renewed, your inner soul is being renewed day by day. There is a future hope, even from 1 Corinthians 15, that one day, though our bodies are broken now, we will receive a new body. In fact, look at this. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, down in verse 53. Paul goes on to say, for the, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. What's he talking about? He's talking about a new glorified body. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Isn't that an awesome hope? But understand, if Christ has not been raised, then we lose that hope. We lose the hope for our loved ones. We lose the hope for our own future. If Christ has not been raised, then all who have died are just gone. The text says they have perished. Well, there's a sixth reality that is ours, truth that is undone, if in fact Christ has not been raised. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, and we'll see that if Christ hasn't been raised, then Christians are fools and most to be pitied. Verse 19 says, if in Christ we hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Let me say it this way. If Christ has not raised and offers us nothing in the next life, then guys, I want to tell you, we lose. We lose. Recognize for a moment the air of the age. The air of the age is tolerance. And it's really a a pluralistic, a postmodern, subjective viewpoint on truth. When someone becomes a Christian, you'll often hear, oh, that's good for you. I'm really glad that you found something that works for you. Personally, I don't believe it, but I'm happy for you. That's even crept its way into the Christian lingo at times, where I've heard Christians say, hey, even if we're wrong, we still live a happier and better life. Now, personally, I struggle with that a little bit. I understand that, yes, God is a good God, and he loves to bless his kids, and that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. But it's also true that sometimes following Jesus is going to be hard. In fact, it seems as though we're promised that we will endure persecution and suffering and hardship by following him. So instead of going down that route, guys, I think it's best to say this is either true or it's not. And if it's not true, then we are fools, and we should be pitied. And if it is true then it is worth actually sacrificing for, committing for, and investing in. Are you tracking with that? Guys, listen, if this is not true, then this is actually a tragic loss for me and for many of you. I've been in vocational ministry since I was 21. And in that time, from 21 until now, there have no doubt been days and weeks and months of my life of cumulative study of God's word. 
thousands of hours of education to learn this book better and better, languages that have been learned, 600 or more sermons and teachings that by God's grace I've been able to deliver and study and prepare and pray for, and I don't know, but probably tens of thousands of coffees that I've had, (laughs) highly, highly caffeinated, sitting across the table with God's people and with those who don't yet know him. But if Jesus didn't rise, then genuinely you should feel bad for me because I've wasted my life. I've wasted my life up to this point and so have some of you. To remove it even just from this context to church history, there have been people through church history who have been on the track to make millions and be high influencers and many who actually have done it and yet they've given it all up for the cause of Christ. Thousands of examples of men and women who gave everything up, even their lives. Church history is replete with examples of martyrs who died willingly for the cause. And time would fail us just for me to share with you people I know right now who are sacrificing greatly. I know a guy who's a multi, multi, multi millionaire who gives away over 90% of his income every year to the church. And if this is not true, then that man is a fool. He's a fool. Each of us who have committed even to some extent to the cause of Christ could have been hustling as entrepreneurs, building a real estate empire, crushing it in stocks and options in the markets. We could have been indulging in the ways of the world and in the flesh. Why? Because if that's all there is, then why not just live it up? Why not indulge in the now? I'll tell you, if Christ hasn't been raised, then you should feel bad for every Christian, including yourself. They should be pitied. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For their folly to him. It's foolishness. If Christ has not been raised, then I'll tell you, actually, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, this natural person who's not spiritual, who is still in the flesh, is right for saying that it is folly, that it's Silliness, mythical even. And not only that, friends, but they're right in trying to silence us. They're right in trying to keep us quiet. Again, through the centuries, countless Christians have been mocked, persecuted, and killed for the faith. And why were they killed? Because the opposing side thought that it was a fairy tale, that it was foolish, it was disrupting societal norms. And if Jesus wasn't raised, then they're right. And those who died for their faith are wrong. They're fools to have held fast to the truth of the gospel and God's word. If Christ has not been raised, every sacrifice for the gospel, all the tithe money given, all the hours of service, all the conversations that are hard and the ones that are sweet were for nothing. They're fools, we're wrong, we lose. And that's it, in this life and in the life to come. Well, if you'll return to 1 Corinthians 15, That's the end of the paragraph. Guys, thanks for coming to Easter Sunday at Doxa Church. Uh, (laughs) Praise be to God, right? That this is not the end of the story. A little bit of a downer. But thankfully, it's not the end of the story. Look at this final sentence here, this, this final phrase, this final glorious truth. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Isn't that good news? This reality, friends, that Paul proclaims here, that he's going to go on to defend for the rest of the chapter, that is proven through miracles and wonders and conversions, and that makes sense logically and is verified empirically and historically, this truth is heart-changing, life-altering, and worldview-shaping. I love how Tim Keller put it, that the resurrection is the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. If we lose the resurrection, we lose everything. But here's the glorious truth of this Resurrection Sunday is that, friends, I have good news. Jesus really did raise from the dead. He really did. He really did. And what that means is that these six realities we've considered are actually in reverse. That, That means Jesus is no longer dead, but what? He is alive. He's alive. That means he has a conscious stream of thoughts right now. He is watching and perceiving. He is alive and even in our midst. Number two, the gospel's not nothing, but the gospel's what? It is actually everything. Number three, God is not a liar, but God is truthful. And therefore, when we preach his word, we are right and also truthful. 
It means that we're no longer in our sin, but our sin has been forgiven and the power of sin broken. It means that those who have died in Christ are not in eternal abyss, but they are with him. They are face to face with Jesus even now in glory. And that is our future hope as well. And Christians, it means we are not fools. We are not most to be pitied, but we are the most blessed, favored, and loved in all the world. Chosen by God and precious in his sight. Guys, these realities, understand, are ours and they are in fact realities because of the empty tomb. And this, I would contend with you this morning, is the most important thing in all the universe. There's nothing more important. In fact, look at verse 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, brothers, in verse 1, I'd remind you of the gospel which I preached to you and you received and in which you stand and by which you're being saved if you hold fast the word that I preached to you unless you believed in vain. And verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing. What is that gospel? If you're new to this, it's this. It's the truth that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures, verses three to five. Guys, here's the big idea. Are you ready? This is the big idea. I saved it for the very end. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the preeminent truth that's worth living and dying for. It is the preeminent, that is to say, the most important truth that is worth all of your life and that at the same time is even worth death if ever faced with it. It's it. It's the most important thing in all the universe. It's the central theme and center point of all the scriptures. It is the pinnacle of redemptive history and all of human history. Loved ones, this should be, I'm praying that it is the defining thing about you, that you believe it that you live it, and that you represent it to others. So listen, I understand faith is a battle. Faith can be hard. Sometimes we contemplate the other side even. But I want to encourage you that even your faith, even the fact that you're here and that you believe to some extent is a gift of God, he's not going to leave you or forsake you. The answer is not just to believe it harder, but actually to turn from self altogether and to throw yourself upon the mercies of our God and Father to receive by faith the salvation that Christ has provided and to believe it because he proved it. The resurrection is the verification of what he accomplished three days earlier on the cross. Guys, I'll tell you, personally, when I have moments of doubt, It is the simple truths that draw out deep waters. It is the simple truths that minister most to my own soul, that bring me back to deeper commitment and convictions. And I would submit to you that it's the simple truth of the empty tomb that ought to compel us to both live for and die for our risen King. Amen? Amen. Amen. Guys, let me give you two quick learning to lives on the way out. We don't learn just to learn. We learn to live. And I trust God's word is sufficient, but let me help you with two questions. The first is this, have you recognized the truth of the resurrection? I don't know who you are, some of you, and where you've come from, but I do know this, is that you're a sinner and you need a savior, just like I'm a sinner and need a savior. And that savior on this day, almost 2,000 years ago, rose that we would be let free. Have you recognized that truth? Have you believed it for yourself? Have you surrendered all to Jesus? I pray that this morning, even, you would. And number two is, is the resurrection the preeminent truth of your life? Or is it just an add-on? Is it a nice addendum to what you do and who you are otherwise? Or is it really the central core identity of who you are? I would submit to you that it should be, that it is the most important thing and should define us and it should put us on a path of living for that truth and even sharing it with others. I pray and trust that you've been helped, convicted, but also encouraged by God's word this morning and we'll trust that it doesn't return void. Would you join your hearts with me as we pray together?